Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to this Montana Book Festival event, Visual Storytelling. My name is Lauren Korn. I'm the director of the Montana Book Festival. And I want to thank you for joining us today. And I also want to thank um, our Collector's Edition sponsor, The Whitefish Review, uh, for supporting us and in doing so, supporting contemporary literature in the American West. Um, we're really excited to welcome book designers Nicole Caputo and Alvin Fisher, as well as poet Heather Crystal and fiction writer Rachel Swearingen to this year's virtual festival. I didn't ask Rachel how to pronounce her last name. Sorry, Rachel. Um, I do want to take a, a few minutes to take care of a little housekeeping. Um, we'd like to welcome you as attendees to submit your questions to our authors via the Q&A at the bottom of the screen. Uh, one of our Montana Book Festival's team members is monitoring the chat and Q&A, as well as Heather and Rachel. They'll be uh, looking at the chat and, and relaying messages um, to our book designers. Um, feel free to use the chat to talk amongst yourselves during the event. Uh, we want to make sure that this is interactive for you as well. Um, and with that, um, I'd like to introduce our designers and our authors. Nicole Caputo is an award-winning New York graphic designer specializing in book and book cover design. She is the creative di director of Counterpoint Press and Catapult, and is also co-founder of She Designs Books, an organization that celebrates women in book design. Alban Fisher lives in Grand Rapids, Grand Rapids, pardon, Michigan, and serves as graphic designer for Yes Yes Books and art director of Sarah Bandy Books. He has designed over 350 books and worked with more than 70 organizations, including 826 Chai, I'm not quite sure how that is pronounced, Alice James Books, The Believer, Bellevue Literary Press, Coffee House Press, Face Out Studio, Open Letter Books, Turtle Point Press, and Verso. Poet Heather Crystal is the author of the poetry collections, The Difficult Farm, The Trees, The Trees, which won the Believer Poetry Award, What is Amazing, and Heliopause. Her poems have appeared in the New Yorker, London Review, of, London Review of Books, Poetry, and many other journals. She teaches creative writing at Emory University in Atlanta. The Crying Book is her first book of nonfiction. And Rachel, will you help me pronounce your name really quick? Your last okay. name? Swearing Jen. Swearing Jen. Okay, I'm sorry about that. Rachel Swearing Jen's stories and essays have appeared in Vice, The Missouri Review, Kenyon Review, Off Assignment, Agni, American Short Fiction, and elsewhere. Her story collection, How to Walk on Water and Other Stories, winner of the 2018 New American Press Fiction Prize, uh, has been published this year. She is the recipient of the 2015 Missouri River Jeffrey E. Smith Editor's Prize in Fiction, a 2012 Rona Jaffe Foundation Writers Award, and the 2011 Mississippi Review Prize in Fiction. In 2019, she was named one of 30 writers to watch by the Guild Literary Complex. She holds a BA from the University of Wisconsin-Madison and a PhD from Western Michigan University. She teaches at the School of Art Institute in Chicago. Uh, thank you for letting me uh, introduce you all. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Nicole Caputo. Nicole, take it away. Hello, everyone. All right, let me get my screen going here. Oh, there we go. All right. Okay. All right, hi everyone. It is uh, such an honor to be here and um, I'm really excited. I love what I do and it's always a pleasure to talk a bit about inspiration and process. So I'm gonna jump right in because we don't have too much time with um, this story collection by Paulina Flores. This was a debut collection of stories, um, nine stories to be specific that takes place in Chile. And uh, the thread that goes through the story is that each character is this really intimate portrayal of them experiencing disgrace, humiliation, um, pride, shame. And I love story collections. They really have a unique challenge of finding something, um, something that's gonna thread between everything, every single story. Um, and tie them all together um, so that each story is represented somehow on the cover. When we first started talking about this one, um, we were talking about, there was a, some talk about using photography from Chile. Um, and then quickly we started talking about this amazing title, Humiliation, that when, when placed next to stories is very provocative. 
Um, and so we started talking about doing something type driven, minimal, bold, stark. Um, and, you know, as a designer, I got so excited because there was talk about either, either showing this title really small or showing it really large. And this is a long word. So it opened up the opportunity to use this a little off axis. Maybe we could run it down the side. Maybe we could run it across at an angle. So I actually sent this out to a designer who I love. Um, and unfortunately, the designs were great, but they weren't resonating with our crew which put me right up against the deadline. Um, and so I went back to my original sketches that I had kind of sent to her and started going a little bit further. So you have, this was actually, I think all of these were sent in the first round and you see the sort of anchoring of her name. She, she has quite a following in Chile, uh, Paulina. And so making her name large, trying at an angle, trying her name larger than the title, very small, very small title in the center. There's actually a spelling error on those two. Um, showing the uh, nine humiliations, uh, repeated humiliations, uh, nine, nine titles to represent each character. And then this one, uh, which ended up being the final cover on the, on the bottom right. And what I was so drawn to in Paulina's stories were the way that she really spoke about the physical manifestation of humiliation in the human body, in each character. She talked about reddening faces, um, backs that were stooped, a body um, that is red and hot while tears stream down the cheek and the breast. And I just wondered if we could somehow show that, uh, that emotion. How can we create a type-driven cover but really um, get some emotional pull for our audience and have a little bit more of a little bit of depth of concept there instead of just, you know, these sort of flat layouts. And so what ended up being the final was actually just a, a really simple rough execution that I did in my living room. Um, so I, I ended up cutting out the letter forms that you see in the in the second um, from the left and literally curled them around a pencil, curled them around my finger to get some of that sort of the sloping of the back in there. Um, how, what, is, what happens to the body when it feels disgrace? And uh, it looked great. I shot it in my living room with my dog right near me and uh, on, a, on a flat piece of white, white paper. And it looked so good that we ended up running with it, placed on a blushing background. And, um, and I like the depth that's created here. Um, I think that that's actually something that a lot of designers are going for right now because everything's flat on screen. So that was great. Um, next, I'll jump into Black Sunday by Tola Ratimi Abraham. This is a novel that takes place in Nigeria. Uh, it focuses on twin sisters as they move through devastating family challenges, um, hypocrisy and patriarchy that they experience in their country. And you know, we follow along as they find their own distinct methods of resistance and achieving independence. And this story is rich with your Reuben folktale. Um, and there was a, one line in the book that said, I like the idea of a God who knows what it's like to be a twin, to have no memory of ever being alone. And I really grabbed onto that. And so I did some research um, about Nigerian art, um, about, about Nigerian folktales, Nigerian artists, uh, Nigerian book covers. And one image really stuck out to me and that was this one with this, uh, this um, wooden sculpture and shows twin figures. It's a uh, Yoruban folk art. And what struck me was this pattern that was on the center, which I thought really showed the connection and the energy of the book really well and this sort of connection of the two sisters. So how do I make this modern? I did my own illustration in uh, Black India ink and then um, brought that into the cover. And you'll see that in the center. And there were a couple of other comps that, that I also showed in that round. Um, the, color, the color palette of the center one, everybody was really drawn towards that cover, um, but the color palette was very close to Ayobami Adebeya's Stay With Me, who's another Nigerian author, novelist. And so we did some palette explorations and we ended up with our final. And this one just really stuck out to me, mainly because of the research and just making sure that we're accurate for the country that we're, that we're representing on the cover, even though it's a novel, I'm sure that meant something to Tola. Next up, God Shot by Chelsea Beaker, another debut author. Um, so 14 year old Lacey May Heard 
is to the centers around. Uh, she's growing up in drought-stricken Peaches, uh, California. Her mother's an alcoholic and has abandoned her. Um, the area that Lacey lives in is bankrupt due to a drought. They had a, a, a really thriving, lucrative raisin fields um, at one point, and it's been scorched by the sun. And uh, the town is desperate. And this cult leader named Pastor Vern um, comes on the scene, and he's promising through these secret assignments that he's going to bring the rain to Peaches. And um, Lacey's abandoned and sadly endures the appalling acts of men. And we see a lot about uh, the relationship between religion and sexuality throughout this book. And it's, it's disturbing and really hard to read, but beautiful, beautifully written and incredibly powerful. Um, so why are we using fuchsia <laughs> and glitter for this story? Well, there are tons of garish details throughout um, that sort of lighten it as we as we move through this really um, disturbing story. There's this magenta hearse, there's sex work, um, there is uh, metallic gold robes, there's neon grass, and there's this glitter and feathers that that Vern drops from the rafters in this church that they all, that he preaches from. So I went with Feathers at first, there was some glitter in there. Um, Godshot was supposed to be one word, the title, but we wanted a really commercial uh, look to this book. This was our biggest book on the list. So I took the liberty to break, break the title. As you can see, the hyphen's still there. It doesn't look so hot. I was so grateful that the author, uh, that the editors, um, the editor and the publisher were open to breaking the, breaking the title. I love when that happens, when they you know, really trusted the designer's intuition there. And here are some of the other <laughs> explorations. Lots of loudness. Um, the pink was not loved. Uh, it, it was thought that it might limit the audience and it probably would have. Uh, the grapes symbolize, um, they have religious connotations, birth, rebirth, ripe harvest, abundance and fertility, to name a few things. They just look too perfect. It wasn't resonating with people. And this was definitely one of those cases where I kind of overthought things a bit because I originally thought, oh, I just want to do just gold glitter, just straight gold glitter, huge type, um, just very loud, but minimal. And I thought, oh, this is such a big book. I, I just, that's going to seem undesigned. And I returned to that after, after I sent these around and saw the team wasn't really into the grapes. Um, they actually thought it looked a little too much like the sour grapes cover. And I was so glad I did. Uh, everybody loved it. Chelsea was over the moon. She actually shared with me that she had um, asked her husband when she was writing the book, she had hoped that one day she would have a solid gold book in her hands. And, and I'm glad we, we gave her that unknowingly. Uh, and here are some, some images of Chelsea at her book launch, inspired some gold outfits by her and her followers and some of our colleagues. And, it was just really great to see this book all over the place. It pubbed right at the start of the pandemic. And um, I know it brought a lot of light into my life and um, it's, it's done well. And we're really excited to see it. It's life in paperback as well. This was also a, a case where I kind of pulled back on the effects. We were gonna do litho foil, um, which is, you know, it's really expensive. And when we went to, I actually set up a press proof for this and the litho foil just dulled down all of the detail in the glitter. And so we actually pulled it off despite a lot of the staff members wanting that. Um, my publisher really wanted that, but I was really confident that if we layered some gloss on this, but not uniformly, um, that we could create some texture in that glitter and that it would really, it would really work and thank God it did. <laughs> so, all right. And next I will scroll through to the crying book by Heather Crystal, our moderator, one of our moderators today. What a special book this has been. Um, Heather, I, I'll describe it and then I guess maybe we'll talk a bit more about it um, in the Q&A, just in the, in, the, in the interest of time. Um, so Heather lost a dear friend to suicide. She was dealing with her own depression and the birth of her first child. As she faced her grief and impending parenthood, she decided to research the act of crying and uh, what it is, why people do it, even if they rarely talk about it. And what I loved so much was the deep, deep research she put in, science, hist historical details. Um, there's quite a bit about art in there as well. Um, 
wow, this was a very long process. I actually went back in to sort of refresh myself on the process and there were 49 emails. <laughs> Um, but it was it was a beautiful process. And here are some of the things that I was really inspired by when when I started to design this, being completely engulfed by tears. These were ideas from the manuscript, oneself becoming tears, the body's physical reaction when crying, which Heather goes into in great detail, the most painful point of mourning at the most abstract moment. Um, was written in her book, Compassion, Comparison of Tears to Stars in the Night, and filling you could fill an Olympic pool with 55 tears from each person. So I really loved just the, the person being engulfed in tears and the person becoming the tears. Um, so this these two were from the first round. Now looking back, I'm like, wow, <laughs> that one on the right is so dark. And our crew agreed. I don't know why I was using um, this dark olive green. And here were a few others, a more kind of watery direction. And then, and we showed, we showed these to Heather um, and she wasn't wild about them. I'm gonna let her speak on that as well. Um, but she, I think, I think, you know, and we were in indirect conversation. So this is being translated through um, her editor who's wonderful. Um, but I think that there was some concern that perhaps, um, the carefully researched details are not were not coming through with these covers and Heather really loved mid-century modern kind of textbook looks so we did this I'm going to speed up a little bit um here are some of those and then I ended up sending this out to uh, a freelance designer these are not the freelance designers these are just some other things that no one ever saw um some other other concepts that I had done and you know through much back and forth um Heather came around to this cover and our team did as well. And this was definitely one there I fought pretty hard for because I really believed in this cover. And I'm so glad, um, as you can see, it was loved out there and people started book facing it, which I was really, really hoping they would. I sized it proportionally for that. And um, there's the final cover. And uh, I'm gonna stop there just because I went slightly over time and I look forward to hearing from um, Alvin now. Over to you, Alvin. Hi, I think. Can you hear me? Um, let me just set up my screen here. I'm not sure if my screen is being shared. <laughs> um, not yet. Okay. Um, hmm. I think that's it, right? Yes. Okay, great, thank you. <laughs> All right, so this, I, th I thought I'd start with Rachel's cover. Um, uh, so her book is a book of short stories um, dealing a lot with um, violence and uncertainty um, and people in these sort of uncomfortable situations. Um, and so I wanted to, to get at the spiritual aspect of that, being in that state. Um, so this is one of the first comps that I showed them. And I believe they were pretty close to choosing this one. Um, and let's, let's see. And here is the second one. Um, and these are 
some of the stock images that I used and I applied um, a half tone filter and um, layered them in uh, these uh, torn paper uh, um, vectors um, with some drop shadow um, and um, here's the cover that we arrived at. Um, there was some tweaking, um, but um, this is basically what it was. Um, and I took these, these vector um, shapes and inserted um, this um, sky image um, and inverted it and added um, like an inner shadow with some noise, um, a teal color. Um, I, I guess I thought of this as sort of like uh, um, <laughs> sort of walking away um, after, you know, having um, uh, reached a state of grace, but I don't know if that really makes sense uh, um, in terms of the book. Um, and this is the, the final full mechanical. Um, um, I, always, I, I always like to try to uh, bring some of the elements from the cover um, all the way around. Um, and uh, um, uh, I like to create as interesting a spine as possible um, because you don't always, um, books don't always get face out at the bookstore. And so if you can grab people's eye, um, just as they're browsing the shelf. Um, I think that's good. Um, and this is for an upcoming book from Saraband Books, um, a book of poetry called Even Shorn. Um, um, very, uh, um, they described this as, um, I think it was the author who described it as nature with teeth. And um, the the poet gets a, some really um, some really deep and deep and dark like emotions, um, but it also has a lot to do with nature and family and um, coming up um, like in Kentucky, I believe it is, um, and so it's very much of its place um, and. Um, so I found this, this old photocopy image of, um, I, is that Queen Anne's lease? I'm not sure. <laughs> I guess I should know that. But I, I um, um, gave it this nice cobalt um, color. Um, then, um, but sometimes when you get a brief, um, there will be some sort of line in there or, or reading the manuscript. And it's just boom, you know, that's, that's what you're going to do. And so once you said nature with teeth, like I thought, okay, if I uh, <laughs> represented that literally, that would be kind of interesting. And um, so this, this flower is Solomon's seal and it sort of looks like teeth. And so I replaced the, the flowers with teeth um, from this uh, stock image. Um, and I like the idea of from a distance, the book cover seeming sort of like a nice, um, like a nice botanical cover with a nice serif font. But when you, you know, get up close to it, you see that it's teeth and you see that the font mm -hmm. is sort of jagged. Um, and, the, and the book is, is definitely like that. Um, they wanted me to try out a few other uh, type treatments, but and they had me enlarge the teeth and then reduce. I originally had three teeth on each uh, sort of stem there, um, but they wanted just two and enlarged, um, but they ultimately went back with um, the, the original font. And that's an image of um, um, a photograph of the actual flower. They had it, they had um, actually um, wondered if I could use like an image like this, but I didn't think that um, a photographic treatment was, was right for this. And ultimately 
they agreed. So <laughs> sometimes it helps to sort of uh, defend your, your choices and you can sway the, the client. <laughs> um, this is for The Bear by um, Andrew Kravak from Bellevue Literary Press. Um, um, this is about a girl and her father in the wilderness. Um, and he, the things that he teaches her and, um, um, and then eventually she's on her own and has to, to use those skills to survive. And it's really sort of a magical um, book. And so I had to um, communicate that, that magic, but also, um, you know, the nature. Um, so these are the first couple. Um, and then I thought of like the, the spirit of her father. Um, um, uh, and this is, this is what I came up with. Um, but um, I wanted to, uh, to get some more of that magical feel um, like um, from an, you know, the night sky. And so eventually that, that led to this constellation type um, comp for this one. And ultimately it was the one that they chose. Um, and this is for The Lake on Fire, um, another Saraband Press book. Um, um, originally, I think it was without the Lake on, without the the, and um, about, uh, um, uh, um, a brother and sister, the, the, the sister grows up and marries into affluence, takes place during the, the World's Fair of um, early 20th century. Um, but the brother um, remains stuck behind in the slums and um, uh, is radicalized and, and uh, bombs uh, the, the world's fair. So I, this was the first thing that I came up with. Um, um, and I thought of layering the two. Um, I was really proud of this, but ultimately they didn't go with this one. Um, they were really close to using the sky image one. Um, but after the pre-sales meeting, they um, chose the, the more historical one. Um, they felt that um, um, announcing it as a as an historical novel was the best way to go. Um, but I snuck the, that on the, the original image onto the spine, so that was nice. Um, and this is for Emma Hines' Stay Safe, which I believe just came out. Um, um, originally I had, um, they wanted me to sort of uh, represent the, the sort of dark aspects of it, um, um, which is the, the image on the left. And then um, there is an image of a, a man attempting to fly in, in, the, in one of the poems. And so I went with that, but they felt that um, there's, a, there's a, um, a lot of women um, it's about these sisters, um, a lot of the poems. And so they had me replace the man with a woman, um, but, um, and it works, um, I think. Um, and uh, here's what I did with the interior. I, I also do a lot of interior uh, for, well, for most of the books I do. Um, I also do the interior layouts. And so I took the feather, one of the feathers from the cover and had it sort of falling because the book is divided into six parts, um, un unnumbered parts. And I thought, I'd have, I thought of having a feather sort of falling down as the, the, the marker for each section. Um, and then this is from my poetry book. Um, um, and I took, um, the opportunity with my book to do a lot of the things that you wouldn't nor normally get away with um, in, um, with interior design. And um, so the, the first one, the top left is um, the half title page. 
and um, the lower left is the title page. And then um, the top right is the second half title and then the verso of the half title below that. And then for the poem titles, I had them arranged sort of um, zigzagging um, on their side and then the page numbers just on the, the recto, um, both page numbers. Um, so I just decided to just do something unconventional. Um, and um, this isn't, um, I wanted to show a poetry interior that's a little more involved and a little more difficult. This took a while. Um, it's a little bit crazy. Um, and, um, uh, I did a lot of this by, by um, sort of superimposing the pages from his manuscript and then sort of reconstructing them um, over the top so that I had everything exactly so. Um, and I think it, it, it worked out well. Um, I think there's the, the risk of creating something that looks too chaotic. Um, and so I wanted to make it look to honor what he did graphically, but to make it look to, look as balanced as, balanced as possible. And these are some more pages. Um, virtually every page was like this. Um, and then this is a book I did for 826 Chicago, um, um, a book of uh, elementary school students, um, uh, monster stories. And I took these monsters from the cover. This is an illustration that was done for the inside of the book. I took the monsters and I had them sort of peeking in throughout um, and uh, taking quotes from the stories to put in word bubbles. Um, on the title page, I took the 826 logo, the binoculars, and had the, the monsters using them. And then, you know, this monster here is at the bottom uh, right is saying, can I hide here in the gutter? Um, and here I have uh, one of the monsters. Uh, he says, uh, I love to rip stuff. And so I have him ripping in the corner of the page. Um, so this one was a lot of fun and I think the kids really loved it. Afterwards, they sent me this packet of like, thank you, hand-drawn thank you notes. And it was just about one of the best things I've ever received from uh, uh, doing a book job. So that's kind of a summary of uh, what I do. Um, I'll send it uh, over to um, um, Heather now, I believe. Hey, um, yeah, uh, me and also Rachel. And I think, um, Alvin, that was beautiful. Uh, that was really exciting to get to see um, both interior and exterior. I think that we might need you to um, turn off your screen sharing um, as we move yeah. more into conversation mode. Oh, okay, let's see. Uh... Hey, you're back, hello, Nicole. <laughs> so, um, so Rachel, I know that um, we both have uh, a bunch of questions to ask these beautiful artists, um, and then we will um, start sharing some questions from um, from our audience. Um, we've already got one in that Q and A box, which is beautiful. I hope that you all will contribute more. I'm sure more questions will pop up for you as we're talking. So um, don't be shy. It'll be exciting to hear what you have to say. So Rachel, do you want to start off? Sure. And um, Alvin, we we want you to come back too, so we can see you. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, you know, I, I just, I'm, I'll echo Heather here and just say how wonderful it is to actually get that kind of um, behind the scenes peek at this process. And for me, I'm sure Heather's probably thinking the same thing. Um, you know, that the process that you go through visually is so similar to the process that we go through when we're working with text. And, um, but one of the things that I wanted to ask about was, you know, now that you've made many of these covers, and I could hear both of you thinking about how your designs are affecting the reading experience, which, you know, as an, a new author, Heather's been through this four times. This is my first time going through this. I'm really understanding in a different way 
how much those um, the visuals, both inside and um, on the outside of the book, affect the reader experience and actually can bring to life things that that I'm maybe not entirely aware of or that are a little bit more submerged that I want to bring forward in the in to tell to telegraph to the reader. And so, um, you know, as you, what are some things that you've learned about um, making books now and, um, you know, affecting that reader process? What are, what are some big takeaways? I guess I could start, also, we'll switch back to Nicole first. Sure. Um, well, I guess, you know, I think the biggest takeaway, and I, I heard in Albin's, you know, presentation too, is just to be, be a thoughtful reader, you know, to really, to really read, read what you're, what you're designing for. And um, um, so I think, you know, for me, that's always, that's like probably the answer to so many questions that you're going to ask us today is like, really be a close reader, really be a careful reader and, and put thought into the process to honor, to make sure that you're honoring the author. Um, but also thinking about the readership and and like what they're going to gravitate towards, um, yeah. And I'll 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 let Alvin add his thoughts as well. Okay, um, I'm not really sure what to say. <clears throat> um, um, yeah. Well, when I was designing my own book, like that was definitely an issue that I had was like being so close to the work. Like I couldn't sort of get, um, um, it wasn't like designing someone else's work where you, you're picking up on things where, I, and I, and I get the sense when I'm working with authors is they'll, they'll feel like, okay. Um, I, uh, these are some things I think, uh, um, resonate with what um, with what I'm trying to say, and um, but I will be picking up on other things, um, and so they might not be things that they they might be things that they that the writer didn't realize were so foregrounded, and so that's what I was saying about my book is I I I didn't have that remove you know I don't know if that answers the question really but. Yeah, it does. It does. It also it um it sort of connects with something that I was going to um bring up, which is uh the sort of psychological element for the work that you do, which also kind of connects back to this close reading. Um, and this will give me a chance to sort of like come clean on what I put Nicole through <laughs> <laughs> when she was designing my book. I am so sorry. Um, but there's um uh, there's an essay that um, I love, that I'm absolutely obsessed with, it's by Noir Al-Sadir, and I'm gonna pop a link into the chat so that you all can see it whenever you want to. Um, but, um, there, so there's this way in which you're being close readers um, and you're you know, reading to see like with as much clarity as you're able, um, and then creating a cover that speaks to your perceptions work. Um, and so the passage that I got reminded of, especially when I was thinking about my own, you know, having a book made into a cover. Um, this is Nora Elsevier. She says, I have a memory from high school in the backseat of the car. My mother was driving. My father must have been there as well, or I would have been sitting in the passenger seat. I was crying, sobbing actually, because my mother and I were having an argument. I don't remember what the conflict was over, only that she was turning onto an exit ramp when I wailed, you don't know me. You don't know me like my friends know me. I may not know you the way you want to be known, she said calmly, but believe me, I know you. <laughs> and so there's this, um, there's this way in which I feel like I was the like child freaking out in the back seat because <laughs> Nicole saw perfectly what the title, or sorry, what the, what the cover needed to be. Um, and it was unbearable to me when I saw it because she could see me so clearly and I wanted all of this armor up, you know? Um, of like this has to look like a really official well-researched dry book because nobody's going to take me seriously as a woman author writing about crying um but she had it i mean it's iconic it's it's amazing um and it took me so long to get there but it is that does that chime bells for you too the sort of um the ability to perceive something that an author might 
um, feel uneasy with, just that you that you have a vision that maybe the author um, is scared of? And Nicole, I know you can talk about this. Yeah, uh, I'm crying over the crying book all over again. <laughs> that's, so, that's such a beautiful passage that you read. And I think, you know, Albin, Albin I'm literally crying. Um, <laughs> Albin kind of touched on it. You know, um, I think that, you know, as re readers and as designers, we, we, we are a few steps back from the material, you know? So, I, I mean, I really, I, I feel so bad for authors because I, I can't even imagine what that process must be like. Um, it's just gotta be, it's gotta be really difficult uh, after working so hard on something for so long. And you do, you come to the table probably with all these fears of, are they gonna honor my, my book? Are they gonna really, you know, understand what I'm saying? But I think we have, we have that going for us that we are, we're, we're not as close to the material. And I think, you know, one of the things I think about as a designer is, and I think what serves me is um, being empathic, like having a strong empathy for others. And I never realized that up until like this past year in my career, just like I, I deeply feel these books and I deeply, you know, I'm a deep feeling person. And I think in this, in some ways it doesn't really work for me so well out there in the world, but in this way, it works very well for me in my career and um, thus far. So, yeah, I think that's, I think that's what I'll say about that. And I'll let Alvin um, contribute his thoughts. Um, yeah, I had a book um, a while ago where I, um, it seemed like there, there was a lot of like anger in the book and I, <clears throat> um, I didn't want to make. I didn't want to make it look like an angry book, but I tried to. I tried to get um, get at that in the design. And when the author saw it, she she said, "That's just not me." <laughs> and so, and um, so I totally understood that feeling of. Uh, um, and so obviously, it did something else. But um, I think that 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 um, gets at like. The, the rift in perception, I think sometimes, so. Is, is that hard for the two of you at times? I mean, when you have a really good sense of something, like Nicole, you're using your empathy and Alvin, you see something in that book that you want to translate that you know is there and there's pushback, like, or, or there's a design that you just fall in love with that you know that's so right. But, you know, at the end of the day, you're still, um, serving someone like unlike with an author like we can we can at least I guess that all of us could choose to not do these things but are there designs that you've that you've struggled with or that that you just get too close to and how do you how do you handle those situations I did feel really close to Heather's cover Heather's cover that process was probably the closest I've ever been I've been to a book in a really long time to like really wanting one design um, and I, when I went back through the email thread, I like kept telling Lee and my publisher, I was like, I think the team is wrong about this. I think these are right. I really, I've said it, I'm going to say it again. <laughs> you know, like I really, really fought for it. And, you know, and I, I didn't think I was, I didn't think it was going to happen. I mean, it went out to another designer. We did several other rounds and then Heather like surprised us, you know, and we went back to it and I was thrilled but that one was you do normally I do try to keep a little bit of space and I try to try to trust the other team members I mean book cover design like yes we are the designers and we're reading closely hopefully and doing our research but it can be very collaborative and sometimes sometimes that collaboration leads you to a really interesting great place um so and, and actually in fact this one I mean I was really I loved that olive green, dark olive green one. And now when I look at it, I'm like, geez, thank God the team was like, what is going on with this dark green? You know, this is too dark. This is, the book is called The Crying Book. Like we can't have a dark color like that. So, you know, you have to work with people, but st stand strong with something that, you know, in this way, standing strong for the overall design was um, beneficial to everyone, I think. Yeah, sometimes you have to kind of, fight 
for, for a company that you really believe in and sometimes it helps but like with the you know the, the lake on fire cover they they really wanted that but they didn't go with it but i'm i'm happy they didn't and um there was a cover like some years ago where i um really fought with the editor who just felt like my approach was totally wrong and um but the, the 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 cover that he decided on i was i was totally fine with but then i guess he didn't show them to the author and the author saw um somehow saw the the, the other version and she and she was like i want this one and so at the very last minute they changed it so. <laughs> that's great that's a, a good turn at the end of the of the story there um I'm, I'm so tempted to be extremely selfish and to keep asking you a million questions and I, and I have them and I'm sure Rachel does too, but we've also got a few questions from the audience that I think we should bring in. Um, so, um, so Megan is wondering um, what recent interior print design trends are inspiring you lately um, for poetry primarily, but other genres too. Um, for me, or that's, that's for both of you. Interior design? Yeah. Um, gosh. Um, well, I, I always try to, um, to I like a, a, a synergy between the cover and the interior. I like the, the whole book to feel like a, one thing. Um, and that's not always possible, you know, Sometimes someone else does the interior, you know, whatever. But I think you're you're seeing a lot more of that now. Um, I don't think it. Somehow I don't think that it was it used to be as important, but I think you do see a lot more of that now. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't really work on interiors, um, so. I'm going to let Alvin just, you know, that's it with Alvin. I, I, I work primarily on covers these days. So we've got another question here from Isabel Duarte Gray. Do you see your work as having a relationship with ekphrastic, uh, ekphrasis or ekphrastic art? Um, well, I suppose there is because, um, I mean, well, with poetry, I think there's less of a relationship there because you're not being as literal. Um, you're, there's more um, of just trying to represent the feeling. Um, um, and then with fiction, I think fiction is a little more literal, but there's being too literal there um, in terms of representation. Um, but I've done some business book covers where you have to be as on the nose as possible, <laughs> you know, like anything you do that looks remotely artistic, you know, it gets kind of knocked down. So, so it, yeah, it's different from, from genre to genre. Yeah, I think that's a great answer. I'll leave it with that. Uh, I might just grab a question from the chat to you, even though we're supposed to use the Q&A, um, just to be a little unruly. Um, so, um, this is, this is actually really interesting to me. So this is from Catherine Gaffney and she says, um, do you think social media has influenced the creativity or artistry of book cover design for the better? And how has that evolved in your experience? And then she wants you to know that this is brilliant, <laughs> that you are brilliant. Yes, I think it absolutely has influenced um, so much. It's. I mean, I think it influences a lot of the trends that we're seeing today. And I think it can be fantastic, like in the way of, you know, with Heather's cover, using it as like a physical thing that's people are hopefully gonna hold up and be inspired to kind of take photos of themselves. I work for an indie publisher. So um, the exposure that we can get with social media is incredibly helpful, just from a more of a marketing standpoint. Um, I think, you know, louder colors, larger type, um, kind of what I just talked about with humiliation, um, inspiring people to kind of add some depth so that not everything is so flat because everything's being seen on screen, um, conversations about 
um, how can we emotionally connect with the viewer? Um, I think all of that, those are all, I think, really positive things that have been inspired by social media. I think negatives might be things kind of start to look the same and you have to sort of like with this trend of using, you know, the art to weave in and out of the letter forms, it's beautiful, you know, and it creates that dimension that I was talking about. But, you know, it's like, <laughs> how many times can we see that? And how can we continue to make it new? I do it myself, you know, all the time. How can I make that new? Um, yeah, so I'll let Alvin contribute too. Yeah, I. I think that's a great answer. That's totally 100% true. Um, yeah, definitely with like larger type. Um, I've worked with clients that want the type as large as I can possibly make, it, you know. Um, but yeah, for sure. And and definitely because you see so many books online now, you, you can spot, you know, trends. And so, you, you know, you try to resist them. And then there's also trying to make them new again. So. I remember um, like years back when I was at Basic Books before um, before I went to Catapult and they're, they're part of the Hachette book group. And I remember uh, my old publisher, John Sher, when eBooks came on the scene and everybody was like, oh my God, eBooks, it's the end of print, what's gonna happen, you know? And it did, it really did affect us in a, kind of a negative way for a little while. But he, I remember standing in his office with him, sorry, I'm like right on the main road here. and. Um, and he said, I think that the book is go the physical book is going to become like this precious gem and you're going to see people using more effects and making them really precious to kind of justify the price point of the print book. And that really has happened. Like what a visionary statement, because I think effects are being used more and more, even though so much is on screen and you're starting to see people, you know, playing with their books and, you know, using them in different ways as ob physical objects online. Um, it's been a lot of fun in that way, I think, for designers. Um, so, yeah, that's another positive. And I think that really matters to buyers, too, because they feel like the publisher wasn't as invested in this as how they feel. What's a thing that someone has done with one of your books physically in the world that you've encountered through social media and been delighted by? Well, certainly the book face thing. Yeah. Uh, I've had I've had a couple of those. Um, gosh, I can't think of one that stands out though. I'm kind of jealous of Nicole's <laughs> crying <laughs> book because that was perfect. Yeah. Yeah, I think I screamed when the first person did it. I was like, yes, it's happening. You know, <laughs> that was fun. Um, yeah, that was fun. I think, you know, I think there are a couple examples in the presentation about the outfits with Chelsea's book, like it becomes this larger marketing tool. Um, and I just love, I love thinking about those things design during the design process. Um, it just makes, it just makes it so much more you know, multi-layered when you're kind of thinking about the marketing team and how how we can help them sell the book, how we can help them get it out there, how we can get that attention. I love that you thought ahead of that. that. And it'd be, I'd, I'd be curious to know, I think we have too many questions though, but maybe just to stick a pin in this, is if there was something that, that people did with a book that you were totally shocked by that you didn't plan for. Um, but let's ask one more here from the, the Q and A. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw two questions out there because we've got quite a few of them here um, and then you can choose to answer one or the other. Um, one is what are your favorite genres to design for? And the other one is how do you, and this one goes in with social media and everything else that's happening right now. How do you keep your creative competence and resilience up? Especially if you find you're not hitting the right note for your clients. This is from Victoria Bithel and Nick Coppernell. So favorite genre or talking about keeping your creative confidence and resi resilience up? I, I really, I mean, I love all the genres and I like, I like, I like working on both because they, I use different parts of my brain and it's just stimulating to have, I used to work only on nonfiction and I, after a long time, I was like, oh God, you know, I started taking in fiction projects, um, on freelance. So I, the thing I love about fiction though, is that I can really 
I, I love to read and I feel like with fiction, I wanna read the entire book from front cover to end. I think it's really important. And I just feel like you can go a little bit deeper um, into, into, well, I, that's not really a good answer. Um, what was the other question? <laughs> How do you keep your resilience and confidence up when something doesn't seem like it's landing the way that you would want it to with, um, with yeah. some part of your team or audience? Or I think for me, it's like just positive reframing, you know, like we've been here before. And I think really thinking about it as like, it's not you against them. Everybody has the same goal here. Um, it can inspire me to, to learn how to talk about design in a way, like as Alvin and I said, sometimes you have to fight for a design. Um, but to remember that everybody's on the same team and, um, and, and to not think, not to take it personal, you know, not to take it personal. Sometimes there are subjective things, like if somebody's, go, I, I hate blue, and, you know, then po pointing that out, calling that out to people and saying, well, you know, is there another reason on the marketing why blue wouldn't work for this book? Um, but overall, just not taking it personal and just remembering, you know, the history, you know, we have that going for us where we've been doing this for a while. The history is that, you know, the, the the book, good, good covers keep coming, you know? It's not that imposter syndrome exists less for me today, you know, because I, I have like a history of like, just because there's a fork in the road doesn't mean we're not gonna land on something that's really great. Um, and if I can be in the moment of, of not taking it personal, there's a better chance of that happening. Um, yeah, I liked the question about creative confidence. Um, because definitely imposter syndrome does, <laughs> does play a part. Um, especially, well, speaking for myself, I'm self-taught, so there's definitely, um, for, I mean, I, it, it still gets to me, but like definitely when I first started out, there was like a lot of uncertainty. Like, you know, my, uh, is this the right way to do this? Is this um, the right direction to take? Um, but yeah, uh, keeping your inspiration up and, and, and staying happy and proud of your work is super crucial in this line of work because it's, it's what, because you're making something out of nothing, you know, and you really need that as a tool, you know? So for me, it's like trying to kind of take myself out of it from time to time and just, you know, and, you know, look at stuff online that, that inspires me or, you know, or whatever yeah so we are very nearly out of time we might have a moment for just one more question um we could um there's a there's a question here um from lauren um saying that nicole i love how you arrived at the final cover of humiliation by working with the paper letters manually um, and this is a question for both of you. How often do you both jump from the computer to tactile materials instead? And I, I love this question because I'm just obsessed with touch right now because I want to touch people and we can't, um, but you all can touch your materials. So what, what do you do? How do you move back and forth between those? It's kind of dictated by the book. I mean, I think, I think that I have a fine arts background, so I'm always, I'm always looking to go that route first if the material lends itself. Like Chelsea's really didn't lend itself. It's a California story. It's very clean, the garish elements. I'm like, that's, the, but yours, Heather, like to have that, even though it was done digitally, it still has that hand done approach. The eyes were done um, by hand. So it really is dictated, I think, by the material. Um, and that's what keeps things really fresh. It's like every book is different and every book is calling for something, for something unique. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I I always love working with my hands, but I think the the this is so that's such fast paced work that even sometimes when you want to take that approach, you you're like I I just don't have time to to figure out because there's a lot of like figuring the process out as you're doing it, and you're, and so you want to, but you're like uh, I don't know if I really have the time to. But, um, but whenever I can, I do, um, and uh, like cut paper, you know, so, some, some effects you can, you can replicate digitally just as fine and it can look really interesting, but sometimes doing the exact same 
thing uh, manually, like just gives it the extra oomph, you know. So. Wonderful, thank you everyone. This was so much fun. I think we could have talked for an, easily for another hour. <laughs> Yeah, I, I am with you on that, but um, I'm happy for the time we got to spend together. <laughs> yeah, me too. Thank you so yeah. much for the wonderful questions. It was yes. really, this was a lot of fun. Um, yeah, I'm just gonna jump back in here. Um, this was sort of my fangirl event. I am fans of everyone on this panel, um, the authors and the book designers. So um, I'm pleased that this worked out as it did. Um, thank you so much, Nicole, Albin, Heather, and Rachel. Um, thank you, audience, for attending this Montana Book Festival event. Um, I want to shout out again the Whitefish Review. Um, thank you for your sponsorship of this year's festival. Um, as a reminder uh, to those of you watching, you can purchase books by festival authors um, and designers at Fact and Fiction Books at factandfictionbooks.com. You can purchase Montana Book Festival merchandise at montanabookfestival.com. And there, I really urge you to donate so that we can continue virtual programming like this into the future with our MBF Plus events. Again, thank you all for being here. I hope we get to meet uh, in real life one day. Yes. Thank you so much for the opportunity. It's great. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Be safe, everyone. All right.